Hello, fabulous scholars. Today we are continuing with the Canterbury Tales. We are going to hear the magistrate's tale or the judge's tale. And first though, the, all the pilgrims have spent the night at an inn, like a hotel along the road. And so that's where it starts. We were marshaled, that means grouped together, next morning by the magistrate who gave such a bark that the yeoman jumped to his feet with his big sword half drawn and knocked his head against the roof timbers. Our upper room was still dark. Beetle, cried the magistrate when he had won everyone's attention with his tut-tutting. Beetle fell right out of the thatch, right in the mouth. Disgusting, not another moment, not in this place. We all groaned, knowing that we would get no more sleep now that the magistrate wanted to be on the road. There followed a dust storm and a plague of nits. That's like lice, little creatures that live in your hair or your clothes if you don't wash very often. As everyone shook out their blanket and piled in in a corner for the innkeeper's daughter to fold and put away. As it turned out, the magistrate in swallowing the unfortunate beetle got a bigger breakfast than most of us. The ladies had already risen. Downstairs, the prioress Egalantine, that's the nun, sat at table, a napkin tucked into her wimple at the chin, and her sleeves rolled back right to her elbows. She had eaten all of the breakfast the girl had laid out for us. Outside, it was raining again. We were so disconsolate that even the ample blossoms of Ashford looked like tearful, pink-faced angels lamenting over us sorry sinners. Then, I thought of just the thing to spite that pompous magistrate. Won't you tell us a story, sir, please? I said fawningly, knowing how much he hated having to actually do anything himself. Oh, well, I don't know. Lots on my mind, you know. Too busy to read much. His protests were drowned out by teasing calls of, Silence in the court! Silence for the judge! So here is the story the magistrate told. Don't blink or you'll miss it. So it's called a snowy crow. Is the character for the story. You know crow, blacker than a sax inside. He was not always so. Once he was white, no morning milk was whiter and his song flowed like honey. He is sang in a golden cage in the court of Alexander and his queen. High in the rafters he sang, Returning home, the king would call, Hello, crow, how went the day? Rest assured, lord, all was well. From his high perch, crow saw everything. He saw the king ride off to hunt. He saw the queen, more beautiful than any other, sit at her sewing. He saw the tradesmen come and go. So it was that he saw the queen's boyfriend call for a kiss and stay for a hug, and he heard them speak of love. Crow's feathers then grew colder than snow, and he huddled on the floor of his cage. Hello, Crow, how went the day? But no answer came to Alexander's greeting. How no, Crow, what's amiss? That means what's wrong? Uh, nothing, so long as I say nothing. Crow's voice was cracked with crying. Go to, Crow, I will know. Then then know that the queen loves another far more than you. And Crow's voice broke entirely and was never mended. The king's heart filled like a cauldron with scalding anger. He drew his sword, killed his queen, and wiped the blade on her gown. But even when she was dead, she was more beautiful than any living. For twelve long hours, the king stood beside her and pondered the words of the bird. Then he lowered the golden cage and tipped Crow out of doors. Oh, woe, Crow, you have made me kill a lady more beautiful than any in the world. What made you lie? I lie? I lie. So, Crow, forevermore be blacker than the night to which you have brought me. As he spoke, the croaking crow shrank back, ink black, from the king's furious gaze, and remained so ever after. Quite right, too, I say, 
finished the magistrate. For what good does it do to speak the truth? People will believe what they want. Is that what you tell the witnesses in your courtroom? Asked Harry. Them? Snapped the magistrate. They know it already. Liars every man of them. Pah! What do you think? I don't know that I like that magistrate's tale. It's a sad one. All right, continuing on. We weren't five miles past Rotten under Blee when a solitary horse rider came thundering towards us out of the woods. His face was grimy and lagging behind him was a tattered elderly clerical gentleman on a rickety horse, keeping up as best he could. Both of them kept looking nervously over their shoulders and we thought nervously of footpads, that means thieves. But when the leading rider saw us, he slowed his horse to a slow trot and hailed us most politely. May I ride with you, masters? Are you running away, young man? asked Harry. Running away, sir? Me, sir? No, sir. Certainly not, sir. We nodded our welcomes and he pressed in among us like a playing card shuffling itself into the pack. You must be prepared to tell a story if you ride with us, said Harry. Will the elderly gentleman be joining us too? The canon, which means a leader in the church, should have caught up by now, but he hung back at a distance, riding parallel to the caravan of pilgrims. He kept beckoning to his servant boy and making pss, pss noises through his teeth, but the boy with the dirty face didn't pay him any attention. Uh, don't take this the wrong way, said the steward, but you seem in an awful hurry to leave Rotten. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it's just a little misunderstanding, said the sooty servant with a foolish grin and a wave of his hand. A little matter of some money which the good people invested in my master's work. Oh, what work was that? Psst, psst, boy! hissed the cannon from 30 yards away. My master, said the servant quite loudly, is a student of the venerable and respected science of alchemy. A research scientist, you understand. The trouble with the people in these country towns is they give an alchemist money because they think he can turn their spoons into gold. But research costs money before you can expect results. There are materials to be paid for, Accidents happen. Psst, hissed the cannon. Keep quiet, Peter. Come here. We were very close to finding the secret, but research costs money. You're reasonable people. You can understand that. Stop, the cannon suddenly shrieked, standing up in his stirrups. Come away now, Peter. Your mouth is so big, you'll fall down it one day and drown. We looked back at two from the raggedy cannon to his servant, who was stubbornly pretending not to hear him. I quit you, boy. I'm off before you get us both hung. And the cannon threw one more desperate look over his shoulder and rode off to the south, cursing his servant loudly. The servant, Peter, breathed a huge sigh of relief. <sighs> there now, masters, I'm free of him. For seven years, I've worked for that old charlatan. That means liar or trickster. But I'm finally free. Look at me. I'm covered in soot from blowing on his fire all the time. So, so you took money from people who thought you could turn lead into gold, said the merchant, insisting on the precise truth. Uh, they must have been fairly stupid to think that your master could make gold, but couldn't afford a new cloak. <laughs> stupid? Peter looked to the heavens. Oh, it ought to be a crime to be as stupid as they were. <laughs> there was this one friar. Um, he suddenly realized that he was admitting too much. Um, did you say I have to tell a story? Okay, well, I'll tell you one about my alchemist. I mean, I mean about an alchemist, not, not, not my alchemist, of course. No, we never did anything criminal. Um, we're research scientists, you understand. But I'll tell you a story about an alchemist 
I know of, okay? So under the thin disguise of telling us a story, Peter explained just how he and his master had earned a living for the past seven years. Scholars will hear the servant's tale next time.